Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shana Weinberg. I'm the Assistant Director at the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. I'm joined today uh, by my colleague, Maya Gamble Rivers, Manager of Programs and Community Engagement. And together, we're gonna welcome you to this afternoon's event. Today's program, Speculative Futures, an artist talk, brings together po uh, poet Portia Olaiwola, the current Poet Laureate for the City of Boston, and CSSJ's 2020 Highmark Artists in Residence in conversation with artists Dara, Kaiwera, Emana, Bayer, CSSJ's visiting artist and inaugural Transformative Justice Program Coordinator here at Brown. The conversation will be moderated by Dr. Lisa Biggs, the John Atwater and Diana Nelson Assistant Professor at Brown. At this time, I wanna sincerely thank the Highmark family, Craig and Libby for making such a collaboration possible and for their ongoing support and advocacy of the center's work. The Highmark Artists in Residency program helped to create the foundation of the center's work in the arts. The residency brings to campus musicians, poets, visual artists, artists and performers whose work grapples with the legacies of racial slavery on our world today. Prior recipients of the residency include the Marian Anderson String Quartet, poet Evie Shockley, the artist Jessica Hill, among others. Today's conversation between Dar and Portia has been over a year in the making. Each year, the center staff begin working many months in advance to plan out what the commencement exhibition can look like. This exhibition uh, takes place in the center's gallery and brings people from all different ages and communities. On commencement weekend, we have graduating seniors, alums, and their family who travel all over the world. Um, and beyond the Brown community, the center's gallery has become an important site for curators, from faculty at local institutions who bring their students. It's become a really popular, and it's also become a really popular K through 12 site and site for field trips. The exhibition work is really central to the center's public humanities mission and arts programming. It helps provide a lens through which to understand the history and legacies of racial slavery in our world today. To date, the center has curated 24 exhibitions since we opened in 2012 and each is accompanied by a print and digital catalog publication that give these temporary exhibitions more permanency and makes the work accessible and available as widely as possible. The catalog includes texts and images from the gallery exhibition, as well as accompanying essays by educators, activists, scholars, and young people. As the center brainstormed in the summer of 2019, what what we might like to do for the 2020 commencement exhibition and program, there were two artists that continued to come up in conversation that we really wanted to figure out how we could connect uh, with them and bring them to campus. I was first introduced to Portia's work through the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, which displayed her commissioned poem and reading of it entitled, What is the Suffrage Movement to a Black Woman? An Anthem. I was on a trip to the MFA with my family my toddler was very uncooperative and refused to walk anymore. He plopped himself down at a kids art activity center space that was in one of the galleries. And it just happened to be right next to a video of Portia reading her anthem. As he, as my son colored, I watched this five minute video loop over and over, a piece that seamlessly explored ideas of power, questioned conventional narratives about America's past, while also reimagining what America could be. And at the same time, the poem was really deeply personal and kept using the refrain, remind me again who I am. The CSSJ staff and I then began to look more into Portia's work. As the individual world poetry slam champion, her video archive of works that included works such as Water and Unnamed were powerful and lyrical weavings of history, family, and contemporary experiences of what it means to be African American today. So we at the center were really very enthralled with her work. And at the same time, we'd also been discussing how we might curate an exhibition of paintings by Dara, a 2008 graduate of Brown. Her paintings explore themes of liberation and freedom, blackness and representation, family, community, and intergenerational connections. They examine the intersection of art and activism, pushing the viewer to imagine new possibilities for our world today. And one of her pieces is on permanent display at Churchill House, the home of Brown's Africana Studies Department. So much of the ethos of the center, this welcome and the conversation more broadly is focused around this idea of collaboration. So let me turn it over to Maya who will share more about the process and collaboration once we all came together. 
Um, the center's small gallery space serves as a site of experimentation, bringing together new voices and perspectives, crossing disciplines and mediums to encourage new conventions and more importantly, new conversations. As Shana mentioned, she had seen Portia's work in Boston and I was introduced to Tar Dara's work um, before I even met her. Um, Sophie, a recent graduate and former student worker at the CSSJ, had mentioned Dara's work that she was doing around transformative justice and that we just had to meet. Um, and so I always Google people before I meet with them so I know who I'm looking for. Um, you can think about it. There was a time where we actually got to meet people in person. Feels like it was just yesterday or March for that matter. Um, but my Google search didn't bring me to a picture of Dara, but to her paintings. While browsing her website, her work incorporated the iconography of the slave ship, featured leaders such as Steve Biko, Harriet Tubman, and of course, Octavia E. Butler. With a caption that read, this tribute to Octavia Butler was a simple gesture to honor her visionary work that has given me a grounded yet expansive sense of what is possible in the midst of the unspeakable violence and oppression that is the status quo of our world. This has truly been a year of unspeakable violence and oppression. When we sat down as a team to discuss the Highmark Artist in Residency invitation for the 2020 commencement exhibition, I shared Dara's work and Shana shared Portia's work. When we invited both Dara and Portia to be a part of the center's 2020 commencement exhibition, we had no idea what would come out of this collaboration. During our first meeting, it quickly became clear that a common thread and inspiration in each artist's life and work was Octavia E. Butler the first science fiction writer to receive a prestigious MacArthur Genius Award, and the first African-American woman to become a prominent figure in the world of science fiction writing. The resulting exhibition, Reflection Abyss Vision Legacy, features new works by both Dara and Portia and is a portal inward to imagine and reimagine possibility. Given this particular year, it is truly a time that requires the imagination. Fortunately, the two were able to visit Ms. Butler's archive at the Huntington Library this January and begun their collaboration before we moved to remote work. While we were unable to do an in-person commencement exhibition as originally envisioned due to COVID-19, Dara and Portia's work continued throughout the spring semester. For all of us at the center, these Zoom meetings and conversations were some of the best moments of the spring semester as we got a glimpse into their process and discussed how to share painting and poetry in a digital space. Today, we are pleased to share with you um, the digital catalog as well as the virtual exhibition, which explores Dara and Portia's relationship as artists, their relationship to Butler's work, insights after exploring her archive at the Huntington Library earlier this year, and the impact of Butler's writing on their work, particularly at this moment. On behalf of the CSSJ, I want to thank them both for their willingness to be a part of this new process, especially during this very difficult year. It feels very full circle to have begun the year in conversation with them and closing out our programming for the year in conversation with Dara and Portia yet again. For this afternoon's conversation, we are pleased to have Dr. Lisa Biggs facilitate this talk with the artist. As an artist herself and scholar, Dr. Biggs is interested in the role of the arts and performance more broadly in movements for social justice in the United States. She's an actor, a playwright and performance study scholar originally from Chicago. She is currently serving as an assistant professor in the Department of Africana Studies, Rights and Reason Theater at Brown. Her current research investigates theater programs for incarcerated women as sites of healing. Without further ado, I will now turn it over to Dr. Biggs. Thank you so much, um, everyone at CSSJ for making this event possible. Um, and thank you to everyone who has been able to join us. Um, I, this is really, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a very, very long time. And I'm just so honored um, to be able to, um, to speak with Portia and with, with Dara as well today. Um, I'm gonna do, uh, share their bios. And then we're going to talk for yeah, about 40, 45 minutes. They're also going to read a little, Portia's going to read a little bit of her work, and we're going to share some, um, an image perhaps or, or two from the exhibition, which is available online um, as part of the conversation today. But um, at, at about five o'clock, we'll um, turn it over, um, we'll open it up for questions rather. So if you have a question, if you could please put it in the Q&A function, um, that would be great. Then I'll have a chance to kind of take a 
a peek at it um, with the assistance of the CSSJ staff, and um, we'll pose some specific questions to the to the artists. So, um, with no further ado, then let's see. Um, Portia. Ilaiwola is a native of Chicago who now resides in Boston. She is a writer, performer, educator, and curator who uses Afrofuturism and surrealism to examine historical and current issues in the Black, woman, and queer diasporas. She is an individual world poetry slam champion and the artistic director at Mass Leap, a literary youth organization, as well as the current poet, poet laureate for the city of Boston. Dara Quayera Imani Bayer is a social justice organizer, educator, and visual artist who is passionate about building interconnected and self-determined communities through transformative and restorative justice philosophy and practices. She has worked as a humanities teacher at a visual and performing arts high school, a restorative justice implementation coach in the Boston public school system, and is currently the transformative justice program coordinator at uh, Brown University, and as everyone knows, an Africana concentrator class of 2008. As a painter, she's interested in exploring history, contradiction, and possibility, particularly as these themes uh, relate to Black liberation. Um, so it's really my, my honor. I'm going to invite you guys to unmute now. <laughs> um, and um, I thought that we could begin. To, um, I know I read the, these um, uh, bios about you, but I was wondering if we could, if I could ask you to kind of begin with um, to introduce yourselves as artists, and then from there um, take a little time for Portia to read from her work and for us to show an image or two of Dara's. So um, just to kind of start things off like as kids what kinds of art were you exposed to early on did you like make art at home um and what was your your first your very first medium um Portia do you do you mind starting us off yeah totally I'll definitely start hi everyone so glad excited to be here um, yeah, my first medium, I would say, um, was definitely poetry, is definitely poetry. Um, I probably first started reciting poetry before I began writing it. And I remember in school um, doing Hey Black Child. That was like something I was known for is a poem called Hey Black Child. Can't even remember who it's by, but I would recite that at all of the assemblies. Um, and, you know, th this is not necessarily an art that um, or is considered art, but I definitely also have historically practiced um, that of the African American arts, so to speak, but that of history, of reclaiming history and thinking about history. So I will say those are definitely my first two mediums. Um, and I'm, I find myself always at that intersection. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dara, how about you? What were you exposed to early on? What, what was like your first? medium? Have you always been a visual artist or have things kind of changed over time? Yeah, I definitely would say that visual art has always been my central medium. I've played with performance a little bit, theater, music, and um, yeah, I played guitar for a little bit, but it's always really coming back to my work as a visual artist. Um, really from the age of being a toddler, I think, like drawing, my mom is really creative. She spent a lot of time making, doing art projects with me. Um, I was really, I really wanted to be a children's book illustrator from when I was really young up until I was a teenager. And so I really loved um, writing stories, illustrating stories, um, creating visual stories, and also painting on furniture was a big thing that I really enjoyed. Um, and yeah, I, I had mentioned to you all earlier, but like my, I think the, this after, before, before this moment, which I'm like really excited to be here with you all, I'm so incredibly honored to have gotten the chance to collaborate with Portia and to like the, the staff of the CSSJ. It's been such an incredible honor to be part of this process, but probably my only other claim to fame is being featured on the show Arthur um, painting a bookshelf <laughs> when I was about 11. So yeah, I loved painting. I, um, I think I truly, truly fell in love with painting as my medium in high school, um, but always did drawing. I did some photography. Um, so yeah, very much in the visual world, art world was like where I was at and really how I identified myself um, from a very early age. 
Awesome. Awesome. Portia, I want to, I'm going to ask you to read from um, your work in the exhibition in a second, but I was wondering, kind of like a follow up to a question about um, you performing as a kid. Do you remember, um, like it was, is that, were those performances like in church? Is that like at school? I know you said that you used to do that poem like every place, but do you, um, how did you get introduced to it. Do you remember? I'm thinking, you know, there's all these fabulous stories about art, Black artists who, who come to poetry and to other art forms out of like a real pressing need. Um, I mean, obviously, like Maya Angelou's story of discovering poetry as a way of reconnecting with her voice. But um, uh, for a lot of artists, e even if, you know, the, their circumstances are not as, as dark and as dire as, as Angelou's was, um, the arts are a way in which have been a way in which people come to voice, come to understand who they are as people in the world. And I'm just wondering, like, it, do you remember who introduced you to poetry, or or were there some poets that or other artists that you found that? Um, and I'm gonna figure out who wrote Black Child. Hold on. <laughs> but um, yeah, like, where did you start performing? How did that? Um, how did that happen? Yeah, totally. I. Um definitely started in school, elementary school, grade school, probably fifth grade, so maybe 10 years old, right? Um, and always at the Black History Month assembly, that was probably my first. And then I would actually do debates later on. And I, I think the first speech I remember, or, you know, speech competitions, but the first speech I can remember doing was one from Hillary uh, Clinton. Um, <clears throat> and so I think that's my first diving into the study of language. I think I, I love performing and I love memorizing poems because, you know, you can really study the intent behind it. And I think, you know, after that is when I wrote my first poem. And as far as my own, you know, practice of poetry, um, definitely like Dara occurred in high school or was solidified in high school. Um, I too am from Chicago, Chicago's most Southern south side right <laughs> um but we are you know home to the largest youth poetry slam in the world louder than a bomb and you know one of my history teachers um told me about told me about this competition and you know i went and i think in that moment i fell in love with the fact i, I was not writing or performing there but i went and i fell in love with the fact that a young person's voice could be heard, if that makes sense. Or in that room, everybody stopped, the whole world stopped and everyone listened to this person. And I, I, I just felt completely in tune with that and, and understanding what a poem could do as far as bridging humans, people. Um, and then I just hadn't stopped writing after that. <laughs> that was my aha moment, right? Is that I just hadn't stopped writing poems since that moment. Amazing. People could definitely learn about Louder Than a Bomb. There's like a documentary about it that's, I think, pretty good. Cardiquim film? Not sure. Don't quote me. Um, no, you're right. You're totally right. Is it? Yeah, it's a really great, really great, really great program. Really great program. So, um, well, Portia, can I ask you to read one of your works that's exhibited um, at, at, or it's part of the catalog? And then, um, Dara, I'll you let me know maybe when um, Portia's done reading her work, which image you'd like me to share. Okay. All right, I'm going to mute myself. Totally. I was, <laughs> I was debating doing one piece, but maybe we'll just ease into it. Um, I'm just going to do the first um, poem in the catalog. Um, and it is, it correlates with reflection. Um, so as we move through this, you'll know that we split this up into different phases um, and each did a, a, a work of art that corresponds to one of those phases. And the first one is reflection. Um, and you know, this poem is a reflection of reflection. Um, and one thing you should just note is that, um, you know, we spent a lot of time in the archives. I'm sure we'll get to this later in Octavia E. Butler's archives. And one thing I just found myself fascinated with was questions, just questions scribbled on the side, on the notepads, big questions, small questions. Um, and so all of the poems and um, have questions that are, are from directly from the archives. <clears throat> and this first one again is um, reflection and it's called The Mara Answers, Who is Fairest of Them All? And it begins with an epigraph um, found in Butler's archives that reads, 
please don't use pictures of me on the book or off it. My picture won't sell anything. Like, honestly, I wish you'd stop asking the same question as if you and I need to show and flaunt. Honey, not a grand gesture in any galaxy could capture a glance of both envy and admiration like we do. So why the self-destruct? Why, 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 why have you ever known me to like that? Have you ever known glass to splinter a body sharper than doubt can? A shattered version of you is still the best sacrifice the gods have to offer any mortal. So why are you here? What business are you really in? Ask your mother, ask her mother and her mother and her mother's mother and her mother's mother before that how a stare can become a shotgun barrel for anyone thinking we don't belong to ourselves. We learned the lesson quick. A well-timed squint cautions children, dares men, threatens countries to cross a lineage of no, of too pretty, of not pretty enough, dark, spell, spoiled, dark edge, swoop, swoop of dark, 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 chubby, nappy, we ethereal baby, you and I appease the sun. We cause mountains to curtsy. There is a whole depth of ocean treasured with the likeness of our complexion. So why the scowl, darling? Why the weeping smile, the bleak eye? We strut and the wind is a wistful lust after our approval. The trees canopy our crowns, arbor of inheritance. Even the concrete cannot bury us. Gracious craters confecting our cheeks, the skin as toiled as soil, praise the night in the jaw, praise the neck unbowed, the spiders webbing a geometry of braids. You know, we've always been flyer than the midnight sky, more breakthrough than daybreak. We stay the decadence of time. Your archaic inquiry, asking what we both know, who cares about us? Who cares for us? Not the government, not our brothers, not our lovers, nor our law, not the schools, the council, the supremacists, the news. No, it is us. 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 And hasn't it always been? I feel like I got to do the poetry <laughs> 60s snaps. Thank you. So powerful. So powerful. Those themes about, um, yeah, the seen and the unseen. And um, I don't want to talk a bunch. Um, I'm going to just ask um, Dara, I, I know you guys had a deep collaboration. Is there a, an image that you would want um, the audience to see at this point? And then I'll come back with my questions from there. I'm just like reeling from Portia's powerful piece. It's just so incredible. Your work's so incredible, Portia. Mm -hmm. um, I feel, I don't know. I'm like wanting now to talk about reflection because that is the piece that that poem is really- I'm so different. sorry. I know no. I totally went out. You told me to follow my heart, Dara. I love it. I love it. That's how we work. It's okay. Everyone saw a reflection already because that's what's been shown for the um, advertisement. And it was what was shown as y'all came into the webinar. So. Um, yeah, I can just talk a little bit about it because I think people have access to that image. Um, or if you want to show it, Lisa, that's fine either way. I'll but, put it up and they'll be able to see you at the same time. So. Okay, excellent. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, and we, again, we'll probably talk more about where this um, a bit uh, reflection abyss vision legacy spiral pattern cycle <laughs> um, theme came from, but, you know, we, for me, like the starting point of this journey was like this depth of reflection and this um, ex like this idea of us, Portia and I situating ourselves in the experience that we were having together um, in relationship to, to Octavia Butler's, Octavia E. Butler's work. Um, and yeah, I think that there's, there's a lot of <clears throat> there's different elements in this piece. It evolved a lot. I had, I was actually just reading my journal from like the days I was in, um, that I was, that we were in Pasadena and kind of like 
thinking about all of the visual, the visual vocabulary I was interested in and in interweaving into these works. And um, I know initially I wanted to bring in like our ancestors visually into this piece and like have them represented because I was thinking a lot about reflection um, in relationship to us as, as a continuum. We're each a continuum of all those who come before us who shaped us and all that we will shape. And that, you know, that's a direct reference to um, earth seed verses in Parable of the Sower for those of y'all who know um, Butler's work. But, you know, I think understanding that we are this um, compilation of, of experience and sacrifice and love and struggle and, and all of this is definitely something that I wanted to highlight in this in this piece and, and, and really reflect on in the idea of um, reflection. And it, it came through also in some work that I didn't even know that Butler had written. She had, there's an unpublished um, manuscript in the, in the archives um, that eventually became called Bl Blind Sight. The first title of it, I can't remember the full title, but it had something to do with flesh. And it was about a cult who under who like recognized that we were each like a compilation of like all the humans that came before us. Um, and I'm not in like, I'm not clearly remembering all of the details of like their, the whole philosophy that they operated on, but essentially it was like this idea that because we basically are encapsulating like millions of years of humanity, like the way that we like show reverence is like through having children and like continuing that or recognizing that we are like this, this continuation. So anyway, I was just like fascinated by like her, her exploration of like what it means to be um, of a lineage. Um, and then definitely, and thinking about some of Portia and my shared lineage in terms of um, the, our ancestors that were both brought from the continent, from the motherland, Africa to, uh, and to the, to North America and enslaved there, as well as you know, Octavia Butler's um, ancestors. And um, so the, the, some of the imagery actually comes from some of the experiences I had walking around the area where we stayed in, in Pasadena. So that, that, that tunnel portal passageway imagery that's in the back and also like at the center in our centers um, comes from some architecture at, at Cal. <laughs> Uh, Caltech, which is located in Pasadena, which is where Octavia Butler grew up and where the Huntington is located. Uh, but also it was interesting, I, I, I like figured out that that was like kind of how I wanted to represent this continuum and think through that and realized it also really looked like the door of no return. So like there's a there's a historical reference here, you know, to that um, passageway from freedom to slavery that many of our ancestors took in terms of uh, being kidnapped and taken into the, the slave forts and then brought into the Middle Passage. <clears throat> um, emerging from our chests are succulents, which also became this motif that was just really powerful to me in our experience there um, and, and really seeing succulents and just vegetation and flora and fauna. It, it came up a lot and she had a lot of, Octavia Butler had a ton of images of flora and fauna. She was like researching, she went to Peru to write some, to do some research for some of her novels. Um, but the succulents really came forward as um, a really powerful metaphor for black resilience and survival and this idea of like inner resource um, that, you know, they, they flourish, succulents flourish in the harshest conditions um, and like, you know, are able to gather all the little bit of nutrients and water that they have access to, to like survive and thrive um, and are like incredibly diverse. And so like, to me, that's like so much about blackness and its diversity and, and like resilience and power. Um, yeah, so just those, those are some of the elements wanting to like invite the viewer to situate themselves by modeling myself and Portia being situated in this painting um, and we, we def definitely like shared a lot in our process. And so definitely was sharing with Portia um, <laughs> phases of this painting being developed as Portia was writing her piece and, um, you know, was inspired by how this, her poetry emerged too in, in what this piece meant and like felt like, um, especially again, like I didn't even think about it, like looking into a mirror, but that also then like came through and became like a central motif that was in the poem, so. I was going to say just that, that I feel like, um, I mean, I know you 
I'm going to ask you guys a question in a second about like how did y'all meet and how did you work together in at the um, at the archive. Um, but I was well, something that I was just really struck by in the juxtaposition or putting these two the poem and the and this image um, next to each other are um, ideas about um, introspection, self knowing, um, what's seen and what's unseen. Um, and even I think it's, uh, it's so interesting that it's um, from the section called reflection in the catalog and um, in both works, the poem and the visual piece, there's a sense of um, inter introspection, um, but also interrogation of that which is, um, you know, projecting images upon this, the, the a black female self. Um, some words that I wrote down. Um, as I was listening to Portia or yeah about you know what is seen and unseen um, a practice of like listing the um, listing those um, challenges or barriers and accusations and misnamings again and again and again and uh, it got me thinking in juxtaposition with the the portrait about how um, you know how we are often named by others before we name ourselves and sometimes you know if it's like a family name or you know someone who cares for you it can be um, a gift but that um, that many times and, and this happens and I think in a lot of people's lives but we are you know uh, told who we are before we know who we really are and as as we grow into ourselves we have to shed those um, misnamings so that we can stand in our the truth of who we are and I feel like personally to, for me today that both of your, your poems are um, a process of um, naming and um, through listing, if you would, um, listing being like an African-American um, kind of uh, a practice of um, orienting oneself in, in a history and a genealogy um, by claiming the, those uh, ancestors or predecessors. Um, they don't have to be biological, right? You can claim anybody as your ancestor. <laughs> That's part of that listing process um, to put yourself in a genealogy. And um, in so doing to um, acknowledge um, how others see us, but also to insist that we see our how, how we see ourselves and that other people recognize those representations of us, how we see ourselves, how we cloak, how we represent, how we how we bring ourselves forward um, and not allow those other those mis, misinterpretations to be the um, the basis upon uh, for how we move through the world or know who we are through the world. So I think it's amazing and ironic that a piece that's called Reflection is asking, um, I'm looking right now at your work, um, Dara is um, really asking the viewer to make eye contact with the two of you. So what's the, ref you know, yeah, really powerful, really powerful, both your work. Um, and I'm sure people are gonna have questions um, and the, uh, so if you do, folks, have questions about the work, please put them in the chat or the Q&A, sorry. Um, if I can um, ask you guys now about your, yeah, your process, like, how did you meet? <laughs> and what was it like working together in the, um, at the, uh, in the archives at the Huntington? Um, my understanding is that you had not met before CSSJ, like, connected you, right? Okay, so um, Dara, do you mind starting us off and then Portia? Sure, I love telling our story. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, we were just reflecting that it's like our year anniversary of, of connecting and beginning this collaborative relationship. So it's like a full circle moment right now. Um, but yeah, I mean, Portia and I both are based in Boston and we know many of the same people, but we had never met each other. Um, and it was, yeah, it felt really synergistic. Like we came together at the center in early December for the first time to, to connect. I, we shared our work with each other and really recognized that Octavia Butler was a huge inspiration for both of us. Um, I've had a relationship with her work since 2008, since I, I finished as like a young person just having graduated college. And it was in the midst of the um, economic crisis then. And just like I had read Parable of the Sower and was like, this book is a prophetic like oh my gosh I need to read all her work and I know Portia at the time we connected was like in a deep dive of her work um and had just talked about like trying to go to the archives and we 
yeah, we were like playing with like, what are the inter intersections of our, our work that we could do some collaboration work around? And we were looking, thinking about lineage and ancestors. We both have family roots in the South. And then it came up to like visit her archives. And I hadn't, I didn't really know much about her archives. That wasn't something I'd known about, but Portia knew more about it. And the center was like, well, we could support you to go there. And we were like, hell yeah, like, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's like a dream come true to, to learn more. Um, and we did some prep work before that, but we really, I think we had maybe like two or three phone conversations just to plan our trip because we were there for a few days together, but we really didn't spend any time together and much before spending all our time together for three days being there. And it was just a really, um, magical transformative experience, um, to, to like really be immersed in her work, um, to like talk together as artists to get to know each other. Um, I brought some elements to create an altar for her. Um, Portia had a brilliant to like in our space. So we rented a, an Airbnb and like stayed in this, this cottage. And yeah, we're like really thinking about like what is the energy we wanna bring into supporting this collaboration and engaging in her work and her legacy. And Portia had this brilliant idea of us writing to each other. Um, oh yeah, so that's the candle. I made this candle in honor of her that we lit. <laughs> Um, while we were there together. Um, yeah, just to kind of like hold that, hold her. She, I know she wouldn't have liked that that much because she was really against personality cults, but we really just wanted to like honor our relationship to her. And yeah, Portia had this brilliant idea of um, writing to each other. So we had a journal and like did some reflecting back and forth over the course of the few days that we, we spent together, just like what was coming up for us. It was kind of like a, a space to just be in dialogue and like reflection. Um, there we go, reflections, like starting from that place. Oh, and there's the book. Yeah, of course you got all the stuff. <laughs> um, and yeah, we oh, we were immersed in those archives for two full days. Um, and then the third day we were there, we went to her, her memorial site where she's buried in the cemetery in Pasadena and like spent some really meaningful time there. And there's some pictures of us there that are featured in the catalog and then also went to the ocean that day and just like reflected and kind of, we're just like in a space together of being in relationship and really being in relationship with her and her work and her process. I think like there's a lot that came through for us in her process of so being immersed in her, like it's, you know, the, she saved everything. And there's like 9,000 pieces in the archives, 300 boxes of her work. And it's just, I, I can't express like the level of, like how love, how much of a gift it was to be in her process, like seeing her notes, seeing her, the iteration, the multiple obsessive iterations of her manuscripts and her frag, fragments of her writing and her journals and her photographs and um, all the research she did that had formed her writing. Um, and just, yeah, what, the ideas and the questions that she had and how she was like that epigraph that, that Portia, read um, for the poem, you know, was like in, in correspondence with a publisher and just like seeing what she was up against and trying to make her livelihood in this in, as a writer and like the level of commitment she had as an artist, like this is who she was and like there was nothing, even though she was like eating potatoes and like dirt poor trying to make it as an artist, like she wasn't gonna stop doing that. So I think there, there's just like so much, and then like what she was exploring and seeing in the world and like making meaning of, it was just like, we were just, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll hit it to you, Portia, I'm talking a lot. You, you, you pick up the, the story <laughs> and like what that process was like. <laughs> yeah, and I'm yeah. wondering, just to hop in, can, Portia, can you talk a little bit about why it was so important to begin, uh, to include in, this early, early phase of your collaboration, that journal process. I mean, that, that's something that I haven't often heard. I don't think I've ever heard about uh, people sharing a journal when they, you know, you teach ethnography or research methods. People usually like, oh, you're by yourself. So make sure you take a bunch of, you know, jot down notes and then go back and, but not, not sharing, not sharing your, your notes, your impressions, your, your thoughts or feelings so early on. Why, why was that in, important to you um, as you approach like this archive, which was it Tashi? Someone recommended that you go to this one and I'm not remembering who that was now, but. Um. Yeah, no, totally. Um, I think Zara mentioned this earlier on, but yeah, I, 
I am, um, I have the blessed um, opportunity to be enrolled in an institution right now. And so I was taking an Afrofuturism class with um, Wendy Walters, who I believe is here, which is really exciting. Um, but Toshi Regan um, came to visit the class just one day and just was beaming about the archives. And, you know, from that moment, I, I just went home and started researching the archives. You know, I was, uh, I had already been slightly obsessed um, with Butler and her work. Um, and I think a week later, we uh, met for the first time, Dara and I. So it had, it had definitely been on my mind. And it was, you know, I think, I don't know if you mentioned this, Dara, but Dara also had a painting of Butler. Um, and I think upon seeing the painting is when, you know, it just kind of magically fell in place. Um, but yeah, the journal, it's, it's so funny. I, di I didn't realize that it was my suggestion, <laughs> but I remember saying, I was so glad we did it. I was so glad we did it. Did, we did it um, mostly because, um, and clearly and obviously, you know, writing is my medium. You know, it's, I think even in class, even if, if I'm in a lecture or et cetera, I write down what I need to say before I say it out loud, you know? Um, maybe that's, you know, me thinking before I speak, but also I think it just allows me to gather my thoughts. And I think, you know, for me, I, I, I don't necessarily, I'm not, I don't, you know, always collaborate with another, with another artist. And so we are both, you know, creating cohesive work and also work that is separate. And so I think it was important for me to really, you know, spend hours, we spent hours in the archives, hours, eight hours, you know, um, going through all of these boxes, these things. Um, and then, you know, I couldn't imagine just going and telling Dara everything that I experienced and listening to everything she experienced, you know? So I think for me, it was necessary to just process what was happening, what was happening in my own body, what was happening in the archives, what did Butler tell me today that I just need to write? Sometimes I just wrote a poem, I think, I don't know. Um, but that was important, just to have a conversation with self and, and simultaneously be vulnerable enough to have that conversation with myself with another person who was having a conversation with her. So, you know, so it was, um, I don't know, it, it definitely, I think with, along with the um, altar that Dara set up, it definitely felt necessary um, to processing, again, what was happening in the body um, and in the archives and the mind and the creative process. Um, but it also felt very spiritual. It felt very intimate. Um, open, vulnerable, and, and, and I know you mentioned the star, but another one of my own personal highlights in conjunction with the archives was, you know, going to um, her gravesite, Octavia E. Butler's gravesite, um, and spending some time there and just laying there in the sun and thinking about the legacy of this woman and, you know, picking the grass and things off. So I don't know, there were some parts of the process that were super academic -y and heady and um, backed by institution. And I think some of those things were not and were completely vulnerable and intimate. And I think one of those things was the journal for me. So thank you guys. This is so, so um, insightful. And I just so appreciate your talking about like an ethic of what I'm going to call an ethic of care. Um, Portia, you talked about the idea of like being vulnerable in, in, your, um, in your work. And I think you know, sometimes, oftentimes, um, folks don't get a chance as artists or as scholars or as, or as scholar artists combo pack um, to talk about how, you know, our encounters with the archive do affect us deeply as, as people. And um, um, and so your example of, um, you know, attending to that up up from the beginning, um, that it's that's part of your your practice is just really um, beautiful, really powerful. Both of you, um, I'm wondering. So um, you have these couple of like amazing days with the archive, and then you like hop on a plane back to the East Coast, <laughs> um, and that like so you're in the archive in January, and then the, I guess the original intention was this to open up at, at around commencement. So you have what, maybe like four or five months where you're working back and forth. Can you talk a little bit about how you, like what were the next steps for you? How'd you, yeah, collaborate after after the immersive experience? Um, Portia, do you mind picking that up and then Dara? Yeah, totally. I'll say, you know, yeah, we, we went the probably January 2nd of 2020 
um, which again, if you read Butler's work and you can understand the context and uh, climate of 2020, you know how imperative it was that we were there um, kind of before quarantine. But then, but then I think as individuals, we both went back to the archives. Um, we just so happened to both be in LA or that area um, and then both went back for a couple of more days um, and, you know, gathered <laughs> our last moments with, with um, the treasures um, before we, you know, came back and really started to focus. And I, I can't remember if the, um, the cycles, we, talk, we began talking about cycles and maybe Dara, you can talk a little bit more about this, but maybe they were in the journal, maybe they first came up um, in the writings, but we decided upon um, one, you know, in looking at the archives that Butler definitely had not an obsession, but maybe an obsession with patterns. Um, and one of the most obvious is just human behavior, the cycles of human behavior. So I think that was definitely a form and structure for us to cling to as we move through this. Um, and our, you know, our um, pattern, if you will, was reflection, abyss, vision, legacy. And so we knew we would, you know, create four pieces each um, that intersect at those ideologies. And I think, you know, knowing that I, I think I kind of went to some of the categories that I felt most attached to, like once we were going over reflection, I, I had actually remembered that I had no idea what to write for reflection. I think that um, it was the last one I wrote, but I just, I, I kind of stared at Dara's painting and I'm like, what is this person staring back at me, you know? Um, and so the process kind of went like that, you know? I think I did, I maybe started with Abyss or Legacy and, and I sent that over to Dara um, and Dara sent me over some things that she was working on. And so it kind of went back and forth like that digitally. Um, but yeah, what, what am I leaving out, Dara? No, I think you, that was, that was it. Like we, I think I remember a conversation, I think it was the second day we were in the archives, like really beginning to identify that pattern or like trying to, to find how we wanted to be in relationship to her work and like what we wanted, what we wanted to share with others and like a journey. Like, I think it was about creating a space or a journey for folks to enter into with us. And um yeah, I, mean, I think that I think you had the idea of like, what if we had a similar prompt that we were responding to as a way to like connect our work. Um, and so like that also made sense in terms, of, I don't know if we came up with like the specific names of those themes, those that in the pattern when we were there, but I do remember a conversation after where we were like, okay, these are like, this, these are the words that encapsulate what each part means for us. Um, and yeah, like there was a lot of texting, like sharing process, phone calls, um, and honey, Dara dropped me. <laughs> honey thought, during, yeah, quarantine. So during quarantine. It, it was great. It was like, you know, a lot of checking in both around the artistry. Um, and it's, it's, I just, I don't know if people can wrap their minds around this, but there's literally 386 boxes of just so much stuff. And there's no way um, that as individuals or together, we could go through all of those things. And so it was really good to, you know, spend time just unpacking things with you, Dara. Now I'm just talking yeah. to you, but you know. No, to absolutely. And I think like what you said, Lisa, about the ethic of care, like that informed how we related to each other and how we were thinking about our process and just like navigating a lot, like in our lives as the, as the pandemic hit. And like, I know, like I lost family member, a family member, my grandmother, like from COVID and just like, yeah, caring for each other and trying to like figure out how to continue to be, do this creative process and be in relationship and like sharing ideas. Um, and, and also in our writing too, because we you know we co wrote our collective statement and that was really dope as well. Because like we kind of, we were really good at like developing some frameworks for ourselves and then like inserting our pieces and then like sharing with each other how we might like how we could and giving each other feedback on that. Um, so our writing kind of reflected also the creative process, I would say, like that's featured in the catalog. Um, and yeah, I, I think that this was, you know, to me, process is more important than product. And I feel like that's always like, that's like, <laughs> to me also like a black feminist, like foundational truth, like the way that you do something matters more than like the outcome. And I think like that is reflected in Octavia Butler's work around like the possibilities of relationship and community in the face of destruction, disaster, and mayhem <laughs> that, you know, is like, and also in her work. 
Um, and I think we were relating to one another and thinking about our collaboration along those lines of like, what does it mean to take care of each other? What does it mean to share ideas, um, inspire each other, you know, encourage each other during difficult times? All I was going to ask you guys, do you, um, I mean, I know you've worked together for it's just a year now, which I have a, I have a colleague that I've I've been working with her since the 90s, so um, <laughs> I'm going to call yours a newer collaboration. <laughs> but um, it, in working together, did you discover things in Butler um, through each other's work? And I'm wondering also if you, um, you know, what what do you are there things that you keep discovering in your own work as as your um, your as your um, as your partner uh, encounters it? Um, what are you What's a year ish, not quite a year after your your first um, opportunity to go to the archives together? Like what is what still sits with you in the the work? What's what's rise what rises there? Um, both in Butler and and, um, and yeah, your your collaborators work. Dara, do you want to start? Yeah, that's such a deep question. I feel like there's a lot to say. Um, I mean, with in terms of like what Portia pointed to that like really supported me in my journey of like deepening my understanding and my relationship to, to Butler and her legacy, I think this idea of obsession and also questioning, um, you know, those are like, I think that those, those are ideas that I think I may have thought about, but not to the depths and to like the, and to like see those things as really central to our collective liberation as well. Um, <laughs> Like this level of like obsession actually, you know, I think we pathologize the idea of obsession, but Portia's like way of talking about it and how she related to connecting to, to Butler's work and then like her incredible cataloging of all the questions that she encountered in Octavia Butler's notes and um, manuscripts in terms of like her thinking process. Um, like was really important to me. Like I think that that to me um, cause I, I don't really identify as a writer. Like I'm more, you know, I'm more of a visual artist, but I think that cataloging and that capturing and that obsessive processing of like, what is someone's and, and someone's commitment, like obsession actually being a, connect, connected to excellence and commitment and like, uh, attention to detail and, um, a level of forethought that also like comes through in a lot of, I think her, the, the, the liter her writing, her actual, her stories, um, and like her, her protagonist, the, the, who her protagonists are and like how they navigate the world and how they um, are like incredibly powerful. And I think she said somewhere that um, she wrote about her, her protagonists exist in the world as if they don't have the like social political barriers around their identity. Like they don't, they're not constricted by them even though they're in the world of that. And um, to me, that is also like, the, I feel like that that ethic of obsession is like connected to that, like <laughs> this idea that like we like there is a drive, a focus, a vision that will not be deterred, um, and there will be like a reworking and a re like a relooking and a remembering that will like inform and like and the questioning that will kind of like continue to inform and deepen and develop, um, and that's an ongoing thing. So yeah, I um, I really feel like that Portia supported me in in that, and I'm um, I'm wanting to like continue to engage and play with that in my creative work, but also just in my life, like thinking about that holistically. Portia, how about you? Thank you, thank you, Dara. What about you? Like, what do you keep discovering in your own work or in um, Butler's work um, through the collaboration with with Dara? Yeah, um, I sometimes I take notes. Um, I totally just want to echo something Dar said earlier, just about process. Um, I like I I adore these poems. I love these poems, but I think more than any more than the poems, more than the paintings, was really the process of getting to know Butler, of getting to know Butler with Dara, and to, of getting to know Dara. Um, and then you know myself. I think that is probably the thing I'll I'll take really from the archives um, is that, you know, I, I feel like I really got to see Butler pass her books, you know, um, because I get to read the books, you know, I have them there, you know, um, but it was nice to see the, the types of notes written on the side. It was nice to see as an artist invoice, 
all of the invoices, all of them written by hand, you know, at what location, on which date, and et cetera, and then whether or not it's been paid. You know, those are the type of things I was really interested in. The diaries that said, I know nobody's going to read this, so I'm going to say this here, and, and me reading it and thinking about that. Um, I think it really changed my life. And one question I kept coming back to, um, and what, you know, the reason I wanted to archive the questions is because I think, um, Dara, you mentioned this, but the, the um, Huntington is a little bit inaccessible for folks, you know, whether that means um, going there for money, whether it's, you know, the inaccessibility of academia sometimes. I think that I really wanted to take out what stood out for me, and, and that was my obsession with these questions. But one question that, you know, just kept coming to me was, um, what business are you really in? And I just couldn't get that particular question out of my head. And I think it it forced me, I, I don't know, I felt like Butler was talking to me and, and, and it made me think, you know, what business am I in? And not just the business of poetry, but what day-to-day -day interactions am I making with humans? Am I making with this earth? What business am I in? What am I doing, you know? So I think that question really just hung on to me. It hooked, to, it hooked me and it hung on to me and it, it's, it was on my wall for a very long time, you know? Um, and I think also one other thing is that Butler was just sad. I think she was so sad, um, sweet and wonderful and, and clearly a genius, but also, um, yeah, sometimes I think she was very sad and that, and that came up and came out. And I think that is one thing I took with me or, or, or kept thinking about is, you know, especially with our, our, our question or our phase or our cycle of legacy, you know, what is Butler's legacy? Who is her legacy? Am I her legacy? Am I to keep having her name ring out from my mouth, you know? Um, but also thinking about our friends and our family and our mothers who are sometimes lonely and don't necessarily have the, the withal to reach out um, and just, I don't know, checking in on folks, you know, just saying, how are you? Just sending somebody some honey during the quarantine, whatever, you know? Um, but yeah, just thinking about the person. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm looking at the time and I'm gonna open things up to some audience questions. Um, let's see, the first one that I'm going to share with you all comes from a Brown sophomore um, who says that they're a sophomore at Brown and a black speculative writer wanted to know what does a Black speculative future mean to you? What does it look like? What legacy as Black speculative artists do you hope to leave? That's a big question. Thank you. <laughs> Jason Brown, thank you very much for, for that one. Um, yeah, what does, a, what does Black speculative fiction mean to you? Mm -hmm. um, what maybe a way to start is, you know, asking what do you hope people walk away from this exhibition with, um, as well as, you know, the larger questions about what, what, what is, what could be the legacy of a Black speculative artist or yourselves as Black speculative artists. So, Dara, we have to go to you first because Portia had to step away for a second. So. <laughs> So, there you go. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Thank you for that question, Jason. I'm grateful for it. I'm glad that you're a specul black speculative writer. We need so much. We need that. Like that is so important. Um, so I guess I, I can start by talking about the last part of what I had hoped to create in the, in the in-person exhibition in which I still hope to create um, in some way on the, on the website. It's not done yet. But the, I wanted to create an altar. I wanted there to be some interactive component to our experience with people. And as they worked, as they read and heard Portia's poems and they looked at the paintings and experienced the paintings. Um, and one of the things I struggle with as a visual artist is that it's a kind of a passive activity to just look at something. And like, what does that mean to just like be a spectator or like observe something but not actually engage? Um, or like, how could, some, how could a, a, a static piece of art move you to like action or engagement. Um, and so I, um, the, the last piece was like gonna be an altar to possibility, like like honoring possibility and our, our potential and like what we could be doing. And like the questions that Octavia Butler was asking, you know, are supportive of that. And I think that's kind of what, to me, black speculative futures are about leaning into possibility and like really stretching our imagination to center and consider 
all the ways that we can exist outside of the current systems that we're in. Um, like even right now, like how we relate to one another. I mean, I, I do transformative justice work. So like this is kind of like the world I live in and like considering like all the possibil all the possibilities that we have access to just internally and in relationship with one another. We don't need like tons and tons of like material resources to be creating new worlds together, right? And that's because we can always shift our relationship to ourselves and how we relate to ourselves. Like the first poem that Portia read in terms of like thinking about reflection and what does it mean to like be in relationship to ourselves as black women um, with, with a variety of diversity in that identity, but like redefining who we are and how we, how we understand what our potential is and what we can and how we can heal and like be with one another and be with ourselves. Um, so I do feel like part of the whole purpose of like black speculative fiction is to like center our diversity of experience um, as black peoples and lean into like creating these ideas of like what's possible. Like let's, let's play with that. Let's think about like all the things that seemed impossible that our ancestors actually did to help get us to where we are now. And like consider like who our descendants will be and like what we could offer them as, and as they reflect you know, 200 years from now about like the conditions we helped create for them to be more free than we even are right now. So I think like the alter of possibility is like, let's re like look at yourself because there was going to be a mirror in it and like some prompts to like consider as you looked at yourself and was like, what does it mean for me to be an ancestor? You know, um, what would it mean for my descendant in 200 years to like offer a prayer or blessing for what I gave them and my, and, and what was my legacy in that? Um, and I think that's like the beauty of creativity and art is like we have the potential to lean into something that doesn't exist right now and play and be like, let's, and like, yeah, create something and not have it be um, confined to like the status quo or the conventions of like what, can, what exists in this moment. Um, you're raising something really powerful there, Dara, um, about, you know, you're not making art just, as they say, for art's sake. You're really putting it, um, I mean, obviously, but um, um, with uh, intention that, so it's not only, you know, reflection of your own experiences, but with these other um, audiences in mind. Um, for the future. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, any work of art is going to come from you as, as an artist, but uh, thinking not only about, you know, the immediate CSSJ audience <laughs> at Brown, but also for, for the future, who, uh, what might people take away from, from this moment? Um, and to, uh, and art is a, an, an action that's not just an object or on a wall or um, a, a poem that's meant to rest and be read on a page, but a, as a, a thing that is a doing in the world. Mm -hmm. So that opens up and makes, I mean, it may um, conserve a past, like as in your moment in which you've written it, but, um, and be a, a space in which to pr protect and preserve cultural practices, but that it's also a doing in the world that opens up possibilities. Portia, um, the student asked the question, and I'm wondering if you can respond to it as well about, you know, um, what does it mean to be a a black speculative, what does a black speculative future mean to you? What does it look like? You know, um, is there a legacy that, that you would like to leave as an artist? And something that I um, pose to Dara as well is, is if there are some specific things that you're hoping that people um, discover in, in your work in, uh, at CSSJ or that you hope people to walk away with. Yeah, I heard, sorry, everybody, I had to run to the restroom, um, but I heard you say before I left that it was such a big question, and it is, and I was listening to Dara, and I'm like jotting things down, but my short answer is, is that I have no idea. You know, I think I probably wake up and ask myself this every day. I think before this call, I was trying to write, see that, to write that speculative, speculative future, um, but the, like, I, I just don't know. I don't know what it looks like. And I, and I hate to say this, but, you know, between starting this project or a year ago, you know, I've been really diving into Afro-pessimism um, and thinking about that. And, you know, <laughs> Dara's like laughing, <clears throat> but really thinking about, you know, modernity and future um, and what that means. And, you know, I, I have a hard time detaching, you know, at its most basic form, the the slave ship undoing the slave ship that is 
in, enthralled in its forms in this country. Um, so I think that is a part of what my future looks like is untangling the slave ship from specifically this country, right? Um, there, there are other forms and other, you know, isms that need to be broken in, in other places, but thinking about that. Um, and then, you know, an answer that I've been coming to or writing myself into um, is really just about black women, you know? And I'm like, is that the answer for sure? Is that the answer? It is, you know, I keep coming back to it. Even as I look at these, these poems and this archives, it starts with black women. And then, you know, there is this legacy poem where, you know, I just ring their names out. I have to say their names, you know, but I think there is something inherently tied to um, understanding and knowing um, what it means to be a Black woman and the perspective that one is allowed it because of that position. Um, I could go on and on about it, but I really do think there is something about listening to Black femme voices, Black trans women, um, and, you know, honing, I mean, if, even if we just look at Butler, alone and, and, and the map that she laid for us, you know, I think there is, you know, a lot of wrongs that need to be right via, via Black women, Black womanhood and et cetera. Um, and I think the future, you know, lies there. And I've been looking a lot specifically at 2020 as an apocalypse of sorts, right? As a, a revelation, as a discovery, as an uncovery. And I just, I, I mean, just yesterday, <laughs> I just was tallying the list of the ways in which Black women showed up to get us through 2020. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I speculate about my Black future, um, is that, you know, more or less lies in my hand and the hands of other Black mm. women. No, it's fabulous. Um, I think, um, I'm not sure if I'm going to do the smoothest transition here in terms of tying um, your um, thinking about the um, uh, what it means to be a, um, an artist, a, a Black woman working in this media, these mediums um, with this question <laughs> from the Q&A. But I, I think um, it kind of, uh, to picks up the question about process and I'm going to kind of combine a couple of two, three people's questions about you all's process, because I think um, how you work, um, how you work together, uh, as well as how you work individually sets the tone about for what emerges. Um, and um, the processes that we put in place, you know, they do um, they influence what comes out of them. So, um, and and Butler's practice of archiving influenced obviously not only her creative work, but what was possible for you all to encounter in the archive and what we now get to um, encounter of her archive and her work through your vision, as well as your your original contributions as as um, as women working in this moment. Um, there's a couple questions about how did you, you know, decide what material to, um, what boxes did you open? How did you decide since there are like so many, um, as well as what it was, you know, was the tactile experience of being able to put hands on important um, or how, what was that experience like? And then there was a third one and I apologize um, if I'm not putting it 100% right, but um, you all mentioned that there, you know, there's like jottings in the margins. And um, I think Portia, you mentioned that her, you know, she has the diary that she, um, you put stuff down because she's like, um, she's no one's gonna read this. <laughs> what it was you mentioned a little bit about what it was like to encounter those very personal things, but um, what was yeah, I think that my and synthesizing to say, you know, um, what was the tactile experience like for you all going through her papers and encountering it, the handwritten notes, the the unanticipated uh, discoveries of the invoices? Um, how important was that? We live in a time in which everything, well, we're trying to do a lot online now. And so um, future audiences, future researchers might not as easily be able to get to an archive. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry, I'm blathering on. Um, Portia, do you mind taking that one? <laughs> just sorry. Uh, yeah, no, I don't mind at all. Um, I'm gonna just try to paraphrase it for myself as I move through them, but mostly the process of um, the archives, what was that like? Um, and are there other things that stood out about um, the archives? Yeah. Yeah, how did, how did you even just like pick 
where oh, yeah. to start. Yeah. That was part Thank of it you. too. Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, Dara mentioned this earlier, but we talked a little, a little bit. We met beforehand to kind of go over the archives. I had also, you know, heard word on the street was that it was it was deep. It was there were plen- too many boxes to even get through, and so we had been well advised to take a look at what was online beforehand, and and we have a little not an Excel document, but we set up a chart. Um, that said, you know, which were our top boxes on which days, what numbers. Um, And so that's kind of how we moved through it. And, um, you know, each night we would, you know, move off that list, what we we had already went through um, and then take a, you have to request the books beforehand or the boxes beforehand. Um, But we would um, then decide what boxes to move on to and, you know, you know, told the other whether or not they had to look at this box. Um, And, yeah, I think another thing that stood out. Um, like what was on the had to list? What was on like the pants on fire? I have to see her blah, blah, blah list. Was it the invoices? Absolutely. Or, no, um, for me, it was, I mean, I definitely the diaries for sure, but it wasn't the invoices. It was definitely parable of the sower um, in like the process for writing that. And more specifically, I think Dara and I both talked about Earthseed and the, the idea, again, I think, you know, when we talk about black speculative future, we talk, we think about parable of the sower and of this black, you know, again, woman, teenager person, literally writing their own religion, writing their own belief system. So I think in, you know, you know, searching to create our own art, one thing, one stop for sure was Earthsea and look, the books of the living, you know, looking at that to kind of dive into, you know, what it meant to to be a person who created your own belief system and, and, and the face of your parents, but also in the, in the face of historical um, traditions, right? So I think that for me, for sure, Earthseed photos. I love the idea of just images of, of newspapers. Um, I, I mean, I want to see it all. I, I was telling Dara, I still have my ID. I'm ready to go back. Like, Yeah, um, definitely. Uh... I think the tactile, the question about it being tactile was like everything for me. Like it was really about seeing, like touching the page, seeing these are the pages that she touched, seeing her handwriting. Um, And I, yeah, I mean, it feels like such a gift that we got that opportunity, especially given where we're at now in this world. Um, But yeah, I I had listened to, I think I shared this with Portia, there's a really awesome podcast, um, uh, um, Adrian Marie and Autumn Brown, podcast, How to Survive the End of the World. And they had actually interviewed some Octavia Butler archivists who created this Octavia Legacy Lives Off, like Octavia Butler Legacy project. Um, so it was really helpful to hear that podcast and just get a sense of some of like what else was in the archives before. Because yeah, the boxes, also the boxes are kind of strangely organized. Like they'll, it'll have some really, like you'll, you'll see a label for like generally what's in the box, but there could be some other stuff too. So there was like lots of treasures like, oh, this is, this is there. Um, I think for me, I was, yeah, I was fascinated with the parable series. I was fascinated with lots of her un, um, published manuscripts. So um, I was, I, re- I spent a lot of time with the third parable that never got finished, um, parable of the trickster, where she was like writing about earth seed like there's multiple generations. So Parable the Talent, you know, Lauren Olamina, who's the protagonist in Parable the Sower, that's like the establishment of Earth Seed, and then her as an adult and an elder in Parable the Talents. And then they actually go to the stars, take root of the stars and like found another planet. And all the notes she had about the world building, like what would this society look like? How are the communities organized? And that's kind of what I'm most interested in is like a political, a politicized person trying to think about like alternative communities and like how we're gonna exist. She was doing the research for that, like really thinking about like what a collective living look like and what roles did people have and how did people share resources and how did people relate to one another? Like she was doing all this research and had iterations like multiple, just her, like when we talk about obsession, like she would rewrite like pages, like chapters and like change one little thing and then just have the same chapter, but like some notes crossed out and margin notes and then another version of that chapter. So it was just like, and I don't feel like you could capture that fully if you were looking at it digitally, like to just go through these folders and see her work. And then there was, there's a whole novel that was not published and I don't fully understand why still, but I started, I read about half of it while I was there. I was like, I just really want to read this whole novel, but there's like diaries and journal entries and like all these other things I want to get to. Um, but yeah, that, that one I mentioned earlier, and I remember the, the title initially was called Eternal Flesh. 
and then it and then it got rewritten and um, eventually became called Blind Sight. And it was the only novel she wrote that had a white male protagonist, which was kind of interesting. Um, but really, you could see the precursor. It like the theme she was exploring being a precursor to Parable of the Sower, and like these belief systems and how communities come together and what is that stuff I'm fascinated. It's like the sociology, I guess, if you were to think about it like that, the spiritual and like sociological elements that allow people to band together and like work together and engage one another. And I think she was really looking at the shadow and light of that. Like what are the shadow sides of people trying to come together in community in really tight ways to take care of one another? Like where could that lead in terms of not so great things versus like, wow, what could like be a really powerful, beautiful future amidst all of these destructive elements that were, you know, immersed in. So yeah, that was really incredible. And then like um, Carolyn's question, hey Carolyn, so glad you're with us today. I, that's one of our, both of our like mentees that we both love and brilliant. She's also like a mentor of mine. I know she asked about um, just like quotes and there's, I think the quote I have next to my artist statement in the catalog um, really speaks to me. I'm gonna read it out loud just to like uplift it. And it was written on an envelope. So this is the other thing like, brilliance just scribbled on envelopes and receipts and like she'll have notes and then she'll have like you know like calculating her bills <laughs> like just like you see the part like little parts of her life coming together amidst her creative work which just are I don't know it's phenomenal to me but I'll read this because I think it really captures I think a light a philosophy for me about at the foundation of what um earth seeds about but also just to me like a guiding philosophy of life so it says a new life is a heavy responsibility beyond the sweetness, um, the sweetness of it, beyond the wonder, beyond the joy, there is the need to protect, to guide, to teach, to shape a new mind, a new person, how to be human. Um, mm -hmm. And I think this idea that is at the center of earth seed of like shaping and being shaped um, and like this idea of God is change, which you know, plays out as like this really profound truth in all these ways in her work and um, adaptability, like what does it mean to adapt, but also like create the conditions that you're in at the same time. Um, yeah, I think of, I think about that a lot. Like that to me is at the center of how I think about my work as an educator, as someone in community, um, in my roles of like being a mentee or like sitting at the feet of elders and like how I'm how I've been shaped and who like all who's whose wisdom and experiences have like brought me to who, where I am right now kind of what I spoke to at the beginning but like I think that really her exploration of that in a way that was just dynamic and just not like not like ortho like she just was like trying to not be dogmatic in any way because she was really pushing buttons and not trying to be like oh, humanity is amazing or like you know, there's just easy answers to any kind of questions of power. Like she really just complicated everything. and was like, nah, it's gonna be hard. <laughs> there's no like right or wrong, black or white. Like, it's just not that, that's not life. That's not how we navigate the world. Um, yeah. No, I think that's a really powerful um, point that you're making. And it's something that I, I think I see as a theme in both of your work time and time again. I mean, I know I'm, I'm just seeing the catalog. I'm new to y'all's work. Um, but in my geeky obsessive dive, um, that sense of like communicating possibility or this idea that, you know, to, to be human, yes, we're like born into these bodies in the time in which we are, you know, um, brought brought forward into the world but that to be human is is something else um it's beyond the raw biology and in our time um just as in the um the times that that butler lived in and the times before us it's not there's no single you know clear path if anything you know someone is selling you a a clear path and i have a like a river to i got a a bridge to sell you over lake michigan um too that <laughs> For, for big money man <laughs> um but that um you know that to be human is a is a doing um and it is hard it is really hard um but i feel like one of the things that your your work keeps both of your work keeps um reminding people i'm going to share my screen one more time hopefully this will go well is that um you know we are we are not alone in it not at all that we're not alone and let's see if i can make this bigger 
that, um, you know, uh, this was one of the images, Dara, that you wanted to share um, today. And um, I wanted to put it up because it, it is this series of images of people standing together, um, some looking back at the audience, others looking more introspectively or down, um, surrounded by succulents, but also kind of encased in this, this um, beautiful uh, powerful circle that is a theme that I think is in both of your work um, really powerfully. Um, and so I realize we only have like a couple minutes left, but I, I wanted to maybe follow up on our students' question about, um, you know, um, how to be human. What do you, are there things that um, you want people to walk away from your work with or that you've learned in your collaboration working together. Um, and if anyone has any other questions, now is a great time. This is not the end of the conversation. You can keep asking <laughs> Dara and Portia questions and I'm happy to field them as well, but please put them in the chat, put them in the, or rather in the Q&A so I can try and get them to, to them. But um, Portia, do you, I'm sorry, do you wanna, can you hop in on that? I hope I made sense. I don't know, I was, I was riffing. No, I was totally just caught up in the painting. Can you say it one more time for me? You're on mute, Professor Biggs. Thank you. Uh, I was just saying that one of the things that it seems a big lesson that working, um, oh, Butler's work I had for you in this collaboration as well is that um, you know she was raising questions about what is it, how does it, how to be human how really how to be human, that it's beyond biology, that it's this, you know, human society is really complicated and uh, a status quo that we inherit is, is un, unequal un, and unfair and, and deeply harmful to far too many people. Um, but as artists yourself today, are there um, lessons or, or um, things you're hoping that people walk away from your work about how to be human? Um, your experience of being human um, right now. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. Um, thank you for doing that. Um, I don't know. I keep coming back to uh, the same answer um, for questions like this. And I think it's always love. Like I'm always learning um, how to love or how to love folks. And um, I think one thing Butler does is like hard love. Like she teaches us hard love, how to how to interrogate the world around us, how to interrogate the people around us and, and I think ourselves um, and how to be okay with that. I think another word is like logic. Like like she, to me, sometimes she is the epitome of mama didn't raise no fool, you know? And to, to consistently have hard conversations with the self um, around abyss of looking directly into the darkness and then figuring out what to do and figuring that out out of love, out of again, out of love of self, um, neighbor, of community, of survival. Um, I don't know. I think that that is the thing that I take away most. And I think, Dara, maybe you touched on this. I, I, I love Butler, but I'm always questioning her everything, you know, she gets really weird sometimes and I, I, I'm definitely okay with that, but I'm always questioning what it is um, specifically she wants me to take away. And I think, you know, sometimes it's not necessarily black and white. It's never black and white, it never feels that way, but it always feels as though it's this constant quest and, and question and discovery and unearthing that feels very much so related to love. So that, that is the thing that I'm perpetually taking away. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, that really resonates with me, um, what you just shared, Portia. And um, it's pretty ironic because, you know, she was a recluse, like really isolated in a lot of ways, but all of her work is profoundly about interconnectedness. And yeah, and I think this idea of what does it mean to be human, I'm just thinking a lot about the um, the Lilith Brood series that has the aliens like meet, mating with humans. And it's just like, yo, <laughs> what is this? Like, <laughs> it's really pushing buttons about what does it mean? Yeah, what is human? What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to preserve? Like, yeah, what is essential to who we are versus not? And really, uh, I think 
gets us in an uncomfortable place about like what's at our core. But ultimately, I think all of her board work is just about like the importance of need, like needing to be in relationship. Like there is no way we could do what we, no way to survive, no way to navigate the messes that we created for ourselves <laughs> without being in relationship. Um, which again, there's an irony there because she was so isolated in a lot of ways. Um, but I like this yearning and recognition of like relationship being there. And so that, yeah, the vision piece and the spiraling is connected to that, I think for me, and that there's no, um, there's no vision or there's no like possibility without relationship. Um, and, and that to me is connected to what you shared Portia in terms of love. And that, that doesn't mean that like relationship is perfect or beautiful all the time. It, it doesn't look like that all the time. And there's like really, there's complexity and contradiction in that, like a lot of contradiction in how we navigate our relationships. Um, but interdependence is like at the core of survival. Um, and I really see that in all her work. Um, and it, it's something that inspires me. It's not something I'm very good at, to be honest, all the time. I'm just being like, keeping a hundred, being transparent about my own like struggles in life, but it's something I aspire to and want and believe we need as like a species for survival and recognizing like, even with the planet and our, and our like plant animal relatives, like we are not doing that. We're not an interdependent relationship. We're recognizing our interconnectedness. And like we see, and she clearly showed this like all the ways that we're destroying ourselves also because we're not in a recognition of that holistic understanding of relationship. Um, I pop in for a second because there's a part of one of, of Portia's poems that I just wanted to share that okay so Portia I apologize I'm not going to give I'm not going to read it like you you would <laughs> and it's it's from the middle too so bad as we go marching to a planetary civilization ends with a question um, and the second stanza reads um, how to sal salvage an antique ascension map the smile of a past Go up yonder's river and swoosh, swoosh, swoosh. Night is filling the lungs, a tooth of adrenaline, an accidental burst of the mirror's sweet, and here we, and we are ego, a droplet claiming itself the rain. Mm. I just, uh, I think I, I wanted to share that because the, the think about with you also how your work um, collectively thinks about um, the doing of the human and how um, and our relationship to the planet, um, but also um, how sometimes in order to enact change requires, as someone in the questions um, noted, a sacrifice, um, the loss of something that can be a freeing, um, not that doesn't mean we don't mourn it, but but that a freeing a transition sometimes requires the loss of transition of things. And um, for myself, I feel like both of your work, um, Butler, granted she was the inspiration, but that one of the things you are asking us to do is to be careful, uh, attend to the past, but not, um, you know, um, uphold it uncritically. Um, to be selective in who we choose our ancestors to be, knowing that they also claimed us. But that you, we are, you know, preparing ourselves for a world, um, and and to be claimed as ancestors one day, and that's a very powerful idea of a role of an artist in society to attend to the present, and um, to the here and the now, the intimate interior space, the quiet, if as Kevin Quashie would say, attend to the quiet, to share it with the world, but also share it with a, a loving and caring ethic that um, wants to breathe the possibility of, of a more fair and more just, more loving, more compassionate um, future into being. Um, I think, unfortunately, we are about out of time. Is that true, CSSJ friends? Yes, Catherine says. <laughs> well, <laughs> on the dot. <laughs> you said, Professor Biggs, that was beautiful. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both so much for taking the time, um, to, uh, spending the part of this af your afternoon with me, with all of us. Um, I want to thank you so much for your work. And um, we will, you know, this is not the last time we will be uh, in conversation. I really strongly encourage everybody, everybody, everybody to check out the online exhibition, um, which is still 
in um, com coming to um, growing, right? Because there's uh, some other uh, parts of it that, that the two artists will um, be con um, adding to it. And Lord knows as soon as we have a chance to be together again, rush, rush, run, run to CSSJ <laughs> so that you can see it um, live and in person and have your own individual experience with the poetry and with the visual work. So thank you so much. Um, Thank you, Thank you so us. much. Uh, uh, this is such a uh, life-giving conversation. Really great. Absolutely. Job.